In this talk today, I'm going to propose an analysis of Proto-Austronesian as a differential object marking language. And I'm going to reconstruct two case markers, one for personal names and one for pronouns. Now to first look at some data in the Tanan dialect of Rukai, we have several different object markers. The preposition ki goes with names and the a suffix goes with pronominals, both personal pronouns and also demonstratives. Demonstratives mark definite common MPs. And then for indefinite MPs, we have a different marker, which is sa. And examples are shown in two with a definite MP in A and a human, uh, a human MP in B, taking the dative key marker and a personal pronoun in C with the a suffix and an indefinite noun in D with the sa preposition. Now turning to Amis, this shows us a similar but slightly uh, more simplified pattern. The an suffix is found on both pronominals and names. In addition to the an suffix, there also is an initial element uh, for third persons. This is the determiner, which also marks nominative case. For first and second persons, we have either a K prefix, which comes from the nominative paradigm, or a T prefix. And the T is very interesting. I'll have more to say about this later. Then common noun marking is completely different with the prepositional element two. And there's an example in 4A of a name and 4B with a common noun. A tile shows a paradigm very similar to Rukai. Key marks personal names. The suffix an marks pronouns. Common nouns take a completely different marker. Paiwan is very different in its marking on names and pronouns, but crucially, the marking for names is, is different from the marking on common nouns. And the common noun marking ta tu tua is very similar to what we see in amis. Now the key points to take away are this is, these are differential object marking languages. So we have different marking on personal MPs, sometimes names and pronouns different from each other. And these differ also from common MPs. And personal marking tends to be with the preposition key or the suffix an. And if a language employs both, key goes with names and an goes with pronouns. My proposal today is that key was a dative case marker in Proto-Austronesian, marking object personal names. An, uh, which is clearly a nominalizer in Proto-Austronesian, could form a nominal on goal or locative argument positions. And here, I'm going to say that when it attaches to a pronoun in object position, it designated the place of the pronoun. So in effect, another type of dative marker. So first, before entering my proposal, I want to talk about previous uh, reconstructions of Proto-Austronesian case. The first by Malcolm Ross, and I also want to point out his view of subgrouping. And the crucial point here is he has identified a new subgroup called nuclear Austronesian. This subgrouping hypothesis postdates his reconstruction of the case markers. But interestingly, if you examine the case markers in the relevant languages, you can find, or I have found, evidence for an additional innovation supporting the nuclear Austronesian hypothesis. But turning now to Ross's reconstruction of case marking, the main point that I'll make today is that he assumed that marking for case was uniform across MP types. So for nominative, it was the K initial, and for objects, this is a dental affricate. The difference among the MPs is marked only by the vowel portion. But this type of paradigm is extremely unheard of, if even extant, in uh, languages of Taiwan and the Philippines. In other words, the differential object marking in these languages is indicated by forms which are completely uh, unrelated to each other historically. 
uh, particularly for personal MPs on the one hand and common MPs on another, and they do not share uh, cognate form at all. But what I will, so I won't talk about his evidence or some particular problems with it. The main problem I have just pointed out, uh, and I'm going to summarize by saying that uh, what is supported by the data in his reconstruction is shown in 10. So the common noun marking, there is ample evidence that K marked nominative case on common MPs in Proto-Austronesian. And I made this proposal in a recent paper of mine. Uh, I think you also could make a case for the dental affricate marking on objects. But the name marking is completely different. Now turning to another uh, proposal by Robert Blust, Blust makes the same assumption that the case marking portion is uniform across MP types, and that is S for nominative and K for accusative. And the difference among the, the different MP types is shown in the vowel very similar to Ross, except that the consonantal portion is very different between the two of them. But again, this type of paradigm is extremely unheard of in the languages in question. Blust identifies two Philippine languages with the nominative paradigm beginning in S. But if you notice his subgrouping hypothesis, Philippine languages are contained within Malayo-Polynesian and Malayo-Polynesian is only one of the 10 subgroups uh, that he assumes primary subgroups of Austronesian. So this is very weak evidence for uh, his reconstruction. So to summarize again, what is supported by the data uh, in BLUST reconstructions are the opposite of what was supported in Malcolm Ross's reconstructions. For Blust, he, got, he does a much better job with the name marking, with the person marking. Uh, there's ample evidence in nuclear Austronesian languages for C nominative. And of course, the key object marking uh, I'm going to propose today uh, should be reconstructed to Proto-Austronesian. So these two markers can be reconstructed, but interestingly, C can be reconstructed only for proto-nuclear Austronesian, which is ironic given that Blast does not adopt this subgrouping hypothesis himself. Turning to my own proposal today, um, I adopt the nuclear Austronesian hypothesis. And as I just pointed out, I have additional uh, evidence for this in the case marking, particularly the C nominative case marking for personal names, being a new innovation identifying nuclear Austronesian. As for the rest of my subgrouping hypothesis, I will not discuss this today, but feel free to ask about it in the question period. What I'm focusing on today is the key prepositional marking on names and the on suffix on pronouns. And I'm going to propose that these are both a type of dative marker. And dative marking for differential object marking for animate, for human, uh, for personal names, these objects is a widely found phenomenon across languages, and famously so for Romance languages. As we can see in 16b, this is a Romance language marking a human MP with a dative case marker or allative preposition. Now, there is also evidence from Tanan Rukai that there is a dative case marker in this language. In ditransitive clauses like 18a, the marker key uh, appears with the goal MP. So I will give the vegetables to my child. And key also appears on direct objects when they are human MPs, as in my father in 18b. Now I'm going to substantiate my proposal today that key be reconstructed as a dative case marker by giving it an etymology. 
And the etymology that I'm suggesting today is that ki was the non-finite, possibly resultative form of the locative verb me. Now, me was reconstructed by Robert Blust in 2003, um, didn't assign it specifically the locative function, but I have built on his proposal and argued that it should be the locative uh, verb itself. And very good evidence for this is shown in the Shiraya example in 19b, where me expresses that the subject is located in the noun which follows me. And this is to be outside, mala being outside. And this was the function that me had in Proto-Austronesian. Now, another piece of evidence for this reconstruction comes from the fact that me is used in some Formosan languages as a progressive aspect marker. For instance, in so as in 21a and amis as in 21b. This is a common grammaticalization outcome for an existential or locative verb. Another piece of evidence comes from the predicative possessors. So many Formosan languages have a series of pronouns that are formed by attaching a labial to a clitic pronominal. And Amis is such a language. And Amis is particularly telling because these pronouns serve as predicates in possessor constructions. So for instance, if you ask 22a, whose is this? And if you answer mako, that means it is mine. In other words, it resides at me. I am its possessor. So this is a possessive pronoun that serves as a predicate. Now we can account for the function of this function of these pronouns by saying that the form comes from the locative verb me and a clitic pronoun which followed it. And now we have the nasal uh, initial of the verb attaching to the pronoun and expressing that the subject resides at the location of the pronoun. Now, one more thing that needs to be accounted for in my proposal is uh, the alternation in the pronunciation. So the alternation between an M and a K initial. And I want to draw on a parallel with the stative verbal prefix, which is ma. And the work of Elizabeth Zaitun and Lillian Huang has proposed that ma be reconstructed to Proto-Austronesian as a stative verb affix. And this is amply supported by evidence from Austronesian languages. And this alternates with what they call its non-finite form, which is ka, with the K initial. And part of the evidence they provide is imperative constructions like 23B and 24B. And imperatives, of course, are arguably non-finite contexts. However, imperatives are also not pure stative events. They always have agentive subjects, so they must be analyzed as dynamic. So I will take an inspiration from some work by Paul Lee on Fanan Rukai, where he describes the difference between ma and ka as ma being stative, but ka being dynamic, specifically in coative. And to me, this is marking a change in state, as in 26, that tree will become tall. So returning now to ki, uh, my proposal is that ki was originally the non-finite uh, and resultative uh, form of the locative verb me. And what it meant was to become at a location, to uh, arrive at a new location, to change your location. And this is what a dative preposition does. If I say, I give something to you, the something moves from my possession to your possession. So this is how key was grammaticalized into a dative preposition. And there are some cross-linguistic parallels 
one from Senufo languages and one from old Japanese that show very similar developments in existential or locative verbs or uh, copulas, which come to be reanalyzed as dative prepositions or, or adpositions, I should say. But I will not go into these in detail, so feel free to ask about them in the discussion period. The point I'm making here is that Proto-Austronesian had a non-finite verb form key, meaning to uh, come to a location, which grammaticalized as the dative preposition key found in many Austronesian languages today. So now for the final part of the talk, I will move to the nominalizing suffix an. And this nominalizing suffix, which clearly goes back to Proto-Austronesian um, uncontroversially, and also uncontroversially, it could create nominals indicating a location. So for instance, the Puyuma examples here in 33 show us a place to hunt and a place to study with the an suffix. This an is also very widely reflected in nuclear Austronesian languages in Taiwan and the Philippines as a locative applicative or what some people call a locative voice marker as in 34b. So when an attaches to the verb, then a location or a goal has a special status in the clause. Uh, in this particular example, it has nominative case. So the point is simply that an is amply reflected among Austronesian languages as associating with a goal or locative argument. Now I want to look a little bit more at some data. And I'm showing you another Rukai language or Rukai dialect, Budai. And here we see the an suffix reflected very, very clearly. In Tanan, it's been reduced to just the vowel a, but Budai reflects it uh, faithfully. The e at the end is just an epithetic schwa. So this is pronounced anu. And now I'd like to return once again to the Amis data. And the alternation, the dialect alternation between the K initial and the T initial, all of these pronominal forms in for objects take the on suffix. But the first and second person forms sometimes have K in the beginning from the nominative paradigm and sometimes have a T. And the T I feel is significant. And perhaps this is the conservative form. And the reason for this is because in some other Formosan languages, locative nominalizations are formed not just with the reflex of the an suffix, but require in addition to that, a ta prefix as in tanan rukai shown in 35a. And this is the case with some other languages like saaroa and kavalan. So the Amis forms a moment ago are showing us that uh, there is a true connection with place in the formation of the object uh, pronominal form. So again, reflecting a type of dative indicating the place of the pronoun. So my conclusion then, just to summarize, I have proposed uh, or shown, I believe, Proto-Austronesian to be a differential object marking language uh, so that marking on personal names with the dative preposition key and marking on pronouns with the suffix and the nominalizing suffix, these were both a kind of dative marker having something to do with a place. And these two differ again from common noun marking. So very much a differential object marking language. And if you're interested in knowing why we have two separate markers for names and pronouns, I'd be happy to talk about that later. So thank you for your attention.